Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Jim Steinberg, Dean of SICE, and it's my great pleasure to uh, host this remarkable event with an extraordinary group of, uh, of experts uh, here at SICE who've been following not just the recent events in, in Ukraine and Russia and around the world, but who've been made this their career to follow these uh, challenges and, and develop the kind of expertise that they want to share with you uh, today. We have, uh, as I say, a broad range of experts uh, who know both the region and know some of the broader implications of these events for international policy, for the United States, for the international economic system and the like. And I don't want to spend too much time by way of introduction because I know you've signed on to hear from them. I'm going to ask each to speak for about five minutes to share their top line uh, perspectives on what's taking place. Uh, and then we'll have some discussion among ourselves. And finally, we'll open it up to questions from you all. So I hope you'll, you'll stay with us. Uh, we're scheduled for about an hour and a half. Some of our panelists may have to leave a bit earlier, but this I'm sure is just the first of many uh, opportunities for us to share and discuss with you of uh, these really momentous events that are taking place uh, in Ukraine today. So without further ado, I'm gonna ask uh, uh, that we begin with uh, Professor Sergei Radchenko, who is the Wilson E. Schmidt Distinguished Professor at SICE Europe and a member of the Henry A. Kissinger Center for Global Affairs. Uh, Sergei has written extensively on the Cold War nuclear history and on Russian and Chinese foreign and security policies. So Sergei, if you could kick us off. Okay, there. Now, now I think uh, finally I'm muted. I always make this mistake. Um, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to present at this event. Um, as you can tell from my name, I. I am a, a, a person of mixed heritage. I certainly have Ukrainian roots, uh, but also have a very strong connection to Russia. For a person like me, as for many other uh, people from Ukraine and Russia, the events of the last few days have been an absolute shock, uh, very tragic, uh, something that just wants you, you know, it feels like almost a part of you has died. Uh, uh, I have not experienced anything quite, quite as traumatic. Uh, in, in a long, long time. Uh, so I feel this conflict at a very personal level, having connections to both places. And for me, it is, it's, it's truly heartbreaking to see what is happening. Uh, what are we to make of the situation? Uh, we have to try to understand, I think, what motivates Putin in pursuing this brutal war against Ukraine. Some people have argued that maybe he is deranged. He's effectively not a rational actor anymore. He has started a war that is clearly costing Russia a lot. It's not clear that he has an end game, that he is having a strategy in this conflict. Um, we don't know what the next stage is going to be. Other people, including myself, I, uh, I would say, would, would argue that Putin has made a miscalculation, but he's still a rational being. That is to say, he understands uh, that there are costs and benefits to this conflict. Uh, maybe his ratio of costs and benefits, his understanding of rationality is somewhat different from ours. He's clearly not an economist, so he's, or maybe he did not anticipate the kind of sanctions that Russia would encounter or the kind of solidarity uh, from the West that Russia would uh, uh, would be facing. You know, this is clear, has, has, has come as a big surprise for many people in Moscow, I think, in the policy community in general. Uh, but because fundamental, I think Putin remains uh, uh, it, at least open to, um, uh, you know, sense. Uh, it is important to keep that, or at least, okay, we don't know if he's open to sense. Yeah, maybe he's just unhinged. But in this case, we can't do anything about it. In this case, I, I would argue that we're doomed. Uh, but I think we should act on the premise that there are still the possibility for reaching a diplomatic settlement and, in my opinion, a diplomatic uh, track, which has disappeared, obviously, with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, should be reactivated in some form somewhere uh, because the alternatives to diplomacy is escalation and war. I'm afraid that we're in a very uh, a dangerous phase of this conflict. Uh, the war in Ukraine is not going well for Putin, this, as much as clear. There's a lot of resistance that the Russian army has encountered, but we should be under no illusion that Russia is some kind of a, uh, um, 
you know, a paper tiger of some kind that doesn't have the capacity to inflict massive damage on Ukraine. And there's a, a every opportunity, I think, for Putin to actually escalate this war, escalate it in Ukraine. And we have already been seeing that in cities like Kharkiv, for example, and indeed Kiev, which even as we speak now is being bombarded by the Russian forces. So the dangers are there for escalation, for further escalation. Uh, Putin has already hinted at the use of nuclear weapons, or at least he is, you know, he's he's threatening this. Of course, you know, uh, this this is a, a form of brinksmanship on the part of uh, of of the Russian leader. Uh, but it should be taken seriously because, uh, as we know, a wild animal cornered is at is is a, is a dangerous animal. So there should be an opportunity. Uh, at least to offer uh, some sort of a diplomatic uh, negotiation to Putin to see whether he may be open to um, a diplomatic solution. And I think that's all I really wanted to say in my uh, brief opening remarks, and maybe we can uh, come back to some of the points I've raised uh, in later discussion. Thank you. All right, thanks, Sergey. It's a very important perspective on some of the key questions we're facing here. And next, we have Eugene Finkel, uh, who's uh, an associate professor here at SAIS and works at the intersection of political science and history. His research focuses on how institutions and individuals respond to extreme situations, violence, state collapse, and rapid change, obviously very relevant to the situation we face now. And like Sergei, he has deep roots in the region. Uh, Eugene was born in Ukraine, grew up in Israel. So Eugene, over to you. Thank you. So I will try to be brief and we fully agree with Sergei that you know, it's definitely a shock to the system, both on the you know, intellectual level, but also, but also on the individual level. I wasn't ready for that, and I, again, I apologize if I'm rambling. I was very sleeping since Thursday, probably like quite like quite a few of you, and then I, you know, moved between doing my professional work and talking to my childhood best friend and read about how many mattresses we can squeeze into our apartment in Bologna if they need to escape. So I'm, I'm not in the best condition. But uh, to start with the to start with the bet, I mean, obviously, looking at the Ukrainian perspective, and that's what I will be focusing on, the situation is very dire. As Professor Ochenko mentioned, uh, the, uh, the violence and the, the attacks are ratcheting, ratcheting up, and now it seems that there is also a pretty deliberate targeting of civilians in main in main Ukrainian in main Ukrainian cities. And you know, no matter how brave the and capable the Ukrainian resistance is, the Russian army clearly has an advantage. And they haven't employed even you know, even a half of their capability. So on in that sense, things are not looking very good. On the bright side, I want to quote, you know, the opening clients of the Sorry, of the Ukrainian and national anthem, the Ukraine, the Ukraine is not lost yet. And Ukraine, I think, surprised many people in the West of its resilience and capacity and willingness to fight. Not people who know Ukraine, it's part of who Ukrainians are, but that certainly surprised people like Putin who did not think that Ukrainians are real people and Ukraine is a real state. In, ter in terms of surprises, I think, what we're seeing right now turns on its head all our assumptions about how politics works and how the world works when we saw. So just, just less than an hour ago, President Zelensky signed a formal application to join the European Union in an expedited proceedings. I don't know what will come out of it, but you know, we're living through some extraordinary time, but in the in the short term, Ukraine is clearly in a lot of pain. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thanks, Eugene, for that uh, very personal perspective on uh, the tragedy that's taking place uh, as we speak in Ukraine. Next, I want to turn to Professor Mary Sarat. Um, she's uh, an expert in the history of international relations and the inaugural holder of the Mary Jose and Henry R. Kravis Distinguished Professorship of Historical Studies uh, here at SAIS and a member of the Henry A. Kissinger Center for Global Affairs, as well as a research associate at the Harvard University Center for European Studies. Mary's work is focused on uh, NATO and Russia and her most recent book, uh, looking back at the early days of the questions about NATO expansion, which are so 
relevant to uh, the, some of the dialogue that's taking place today. And so uh, both from her perspective on understanding some of the roots and, and the arguments about the, the sources of this conflict, Mary brings a particularly valuable perspective. So Mary, over to you. Yes, excellent. And thank you, Jim, for organizing this panel. I uh, just want to say our, our hearts go out to all the people of Ukraine. It is um, truly remarkable how much they've been able to hold off uh, this horrible invasion. And um, I, I just want to voice my, my respect and uh, sympathy. Yes, as Jim said, uh, my, I, I don't have family connections to the area. I, for many years, I've been researching a book about the fight between the US and Russia over NATO enlargement, over Ukrainian, and also then the way they also worked together to denuclearize Ukraine. That book is called Not One Inch. And ever since Putin started saying that phrase, not one inch, at press conferences as a seeming justification for taking Ukraine hostage and now invading Ukraine, my life has been surreal. I've just been um, besieged with requests to talk about that historical issue and the way that Putin is misusing history to uh, justify what he is doing, which is which I find abhorrent. Uh, I just want to make three quick points. And um, the first is that I'd like to also um, uh, praise the Biden administration for its handling of NATO and the allies, which I think has been exemplary. Uh, he has he and his team have really pulled together a response in coordination with a lot of countries. And I think that has been uh, very impressive. Uh, number two, the issue that I am watching is the Russian popular response. Uh, some of you may have seen photos yesterday out of the city of Berlin showing 100,000 people marching in support of Ukraine. If you look at those photos, you will notice in the background is the Brandenburg Gate. The Brandenburg Gate is where on uh, November 9th, 1989, the power of the people brought down the wall and brought down tyrants. I think there is a lesson there for Putin. I think he should be very wary of what he has begun. The question is what domestic effects will this have when Russians can't get cash out of the cash machines, when all their flights are canceled, uh, when prices are going up 30% overnight, Will we finally, will we see scenes in Russia like we have just seen yesterday in Berlin? Obviously in Berlin, it was a peaceful protest in support of Ukraine. So I just mean visually, but will we start to see mass numbers of people come out onto the street in Russia? I don't know. I think that is one of the key questions. And then uh, the third and final point actually comes from Sun Tzu on military strategy. I agree with Sergei that we are in very dangerous territory up to and including we may all be doomed if Putin really has uh, become insane and is in control of a strategic, a strategic nuclear arsenal. So Sun Tzu said, it is important to build your opponent a golden bridge to retreat across. In other words, something that is very attractive to your opponent. I think we should be looking for a lot of gold to put onto that bridge to find a way to back the world down from this crisis. Thank you. Great, Mary, thanks for that. And uh, we'll get back to some that, that uh, led up to these events. Um, I next want to turn to Ann Applebaum. Ann is um, seen in a Pulitzer Prize winning historian uh, here at SICE and, and Johns Hopkins. She's a senior fellow at the SNF Agora Institute, uh, as well as a fellow here at, at SICE, where she co and co directs ARENA, a program on disinformation and 21st century propaganda. And over to you. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Um, it's um, it's been quite a week for me, and I'm sorry it took me. I was a, I was a minute or two late. I hope that didn't that didn't make a difference. Um, I'm actually going to start by picking up on something that Mary just said, which is about you know the the power of popular demonstrations. Um, I think that that is actually that power and the language around it and the images around it are a, a very important part of the source of this whole story. Um, when Putin himself was in Berlin, or not in Berlin, he was in Dresden in East Germany in 1989, he witnessed that. He saw how, um, how crowds chanting democracy slogans uh, overcame the regime. Um, he has a personal memory that he's described several times 
about being in the KGB headquarters outside of Dresden at that time and burning papers and being afraid that you know, the demonstrators would come in. Um, and all of his career, he's had a powerful um, anxiety, in, particularly in the last several years, and particularly since big demonstrations across Russia in 2011, he's had this anxiety that this would happen to him, that the end of his power would be exactly that, a kind of street demonstration. I think that obsession is exactly what explains his obsession in turn with Ukraine. Um, he saw the 2014 revolution in Ukraine as a, as, a, as a turning point, as a moment when Ukraine ceased to be in the Russian orbit, it ceased to be under Russian influence. And he's actually, in the last couple of days in some of his statements, he's more or less said this. He had a line in one of his, in one of his um, paranoid television appearances about um, about influence from the West coming to us from Ukraine. And what he means is the influence of democratic ideas, ideas about transparency, about the rule of law, um, all of which could potentially damage his autocratic, kleptocratic political system and you know, that, that, keeps him, um, that keeps him in power. Um, it's been my view from the beginning that the conversation about NATO is it's not exactly a red herring because he clearly and he cares about NATO, um, but that isn't what's at the core of the problem here. It's not it's not that Putin is afraid of NATO. He he can count tanks just as well as anybody else can. He knows that NATO is not in a position to invade him right now. Um, he knows that however many you know few hundreds of um, troops are in Poland or Romania, that's not doesn't affect the balance of power in Europe in any serious way. Um, he uses the NATO issue as a way of um, goading and um, expressing and, and sort of packaging his views for diplomatic purposes and also for the purposes of domestic propaganda. But really his obsession is with Ukraine and Ukraine itself. And that unfortunately is what I think makes this conflict so dangerous. In other words, I don't think that even if we were to rush to Moscow and say, okay, we promise, 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 we'll never let Ukraine in NATO. I don't think that ends the problem because that isn't really the problem. The problem is the, um, the challenge to his authority and his political system that is that Ukraine has has come to represent and probably even more so now. Um, uh, you know, two more points. I mean, one of the really astonishing things that's happened in the last four days. I mean, I don't know about the rest of you. I feel really like history is moving very fast uh, and things are happening that seemed impossible just a week ago. Um, but one of the sources of the speed of that change is Ukraine itself. And so up until now, so much of the talk, again, America, NATO, Russia, Biden, Putin, suddenly it's really the Ukrainians who've changed the story. Um, it was Zelensky's films of himself, in particular the one where he said he stood in front of the presidential palace in Kiev. He said, I'm here, the prime minister is here, my chief of staff is here, none of us are going anywhere, we're staying and we're defending the country. Um, I think that, I think the sight of so many Ukrainians, not just in the military, but in the ordinary civilians who joined the territorial army, um, you know, participating and working together to help one another and also to push back against this invasion has suddenly made people realize that this is not some kind of basket case country, you know, uh, um, that didn't really mean anything or do anything. Suddenly it has a personality, it has an identity. Um, and that's changed already the way, certainly in Europe, Ukraine is perceived. It may also eventually change the way Ukrainians perceive themselves. Um, it's a really watershed moment. What, and stipulate many, there are many dark scenarios and bad things that could still happen, but I still think that this, this moment will be remembered. One of the effects of it, of it already is a revolutionary change in German politics. The Germans have now reversed almost everything they've said in the last weeks. Um, the chancellor has announced a rise in the defense budget. The Germans have said they will export some of their weapons to Ukraine. And so immediately you have a chain, a really profound sea change in Germany that was just unimaginable a week ago. Um, similarly, the European Union, you know, which has always been a bit wishy-washy and hesitant about Ukraine, um, despite Polish and other efforts to get, you know, create trade arrangements and other, other, other institutional links. Um, you, you, you know, European Union extraordinarily is now organizing uh, fighter jets for Ukraine, um, which I believe are already there. This happened yesterday, um, and is and and there have already some positive words spoken about Ukrainian accession to the EU. Now, whether that is possible, given how complicated it is to join the EU, I have no idea. But the atmosphere around Ukraine has now has already changed. 
totally. Um, and I think permanently, uh, I hope permanently. Finally, I would say one other thing, again, coming back to the beginning of my comments and to Mary's comments, to me, what's much more important is not the street revolution in Russia, which I don't think, and my colleagues um, who are in closer touch will correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that's a likely path to change in Russia right now. Um, what's more interesting to me is what elite Russian thinks, and by elite, I mean the very, very, very elite. I mean the, the very few people who are anywhere near Putin. He has very few, not many around him right now. Um, he spent the last two years in a kind of, you know, COVID bunker, um, afraid to talk to people. You had to be in quarantine before you could reach him. Um, and so he's out of touch with a lot of people he used to be in touch with. But whoever is there, whether it's his top generals, whether it's one or two advisors, whether it's his bodyguards, um, you know, will there be someone around him who can say stop or who will prevent him from doing something truly disastrous? Um, I think that's the question. And unfortunately, I have to say, I have, I've, I've just been asked it five minutes ago before joining this group. I was on a, I was recording an NPR program um, and, and I was asked exactly that question. And of course, I have no idea. I, have, I don't have a way to answer it. And I don't think anybody does. Um, but the, so the question is, will, is there someone there who can stop him? I think it's become clearer in the last few days, much clearer than it ever was, that he himself is the problem. It's not just that the whole Russian elite agrees with him. And, and there is, a, you know, I, I can imagine him being replaced by someone who is just as bad. Um, but, but there's also a chance that he's, he's, he's changed in some profound ways um, in, in, in recent months. Um, and so we are reliant on the existence of people whose names we don't know um, to maybe prevent him from doing something disastrous. I'll stop there, but I'm glad to continue the conversation. Great, and thanks for that. Lots of really thoughtful things to chew on here. I, you, spent, you talked a little bit about the European reaction, so I thought that might be a, a good lead into our next speaker, um, Professor Matthias Matis, um, who's an associate professor of international political economy here at SAIS. And his research focuses on the politics of economic crises, the role of economic ideas in economic policymaking, and the politics of regional integration, in particular of Europe. Um, so, uh, Matthias, uh, your your perspective on the European response and other thoughts. Thank you, uh, Jim, and you know, warm welcome to um, the close to seven hundred people who uh, who logged on to this. I mean, let a lot of thoughts and only a few minutes to speak. So, let me first of all say that. As much as this collective panel knows about things, I think none of us really know what's going to happen next, right? I mean, we we can definitely talk about what's happened in the last few weeks, and I think Anne Applebaum is absolutely right. History does seem to be moving um, incredibly, incredibly fast. So I'll I'll focus on Germany and the EU, and 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 Anne has already mentioned some of the of, of those shifts, and you know in our political science classes, we, we talk about paradigm shifts, but this definitely feels like, like a paradigm shift in German foreign policy and, and even in, in the EU that we are seeing right now. And it really is this um, uh, behavior of Vladimir Putin in the last month that's kind of set the stage uh, for this. So one, one thing, and, and I need to get it off my chest because Johns Hopkins University gave Angela Merkel an honorary doctorate last summer, which I was definitely not consulted on, I've always felt that Angela Merkel has gotten way too much praise for um, being kind of a beacon for liberal democracy, human rights, and steadfast leadership, and, and so on. So in this piece last summer with Dan Kellerman in Foreign Policy, was the other, uh, I wrote about the other side of Angela Merkel. And I think a lot of things that uh, she was about, both her tactics and her strategy, have come to a kind of dramatic ending in just uh, the, last, the last few weeks, actually the last week more precisely. First of all, her tactics used to be those uh, known in, by German teenagers as Merkel. Merkel is the, a German word based on her name about dithering, about waiting to make the tough decisions to the very last moment. And of course, this came to a head during the Eurozone crisis. But what you've seen in the last week is that there's been no dithering of this new uh, German uh, government. They've made incredibly fast decisions and a lot of taboos have been broken. And I'll come back to this. Secondly, Merkel's strategy, uh, we described uh, Dan Kellerman and I in foreign policy as mercantilism, systematically putting geo-economic and commercial interests ahead of human rights and democratic principles. Right? That has been true in the way she's been dealing with Poland and Hungary and democratic backsliding there, but definitely 
uh, with, with Putin. She got a lot of praise for putting together a very strong coalition in 2014 of sanctions after the annexation of Crimea and uh, the conflict in the Donbass that Putin started. But in the end, she happily kept building on to Nord Stream 2. And the idea that Nord Stream 2 was not gonna become operational even a month ago seemed, um, seemed unthinkable. And that's now where, uh, where we are. So this is not just the end of Merkel's um, policy, right? Merkel fell into a long tradition of German Ostpolitik that was started by Willy Brandt in the late 1960s, early 1970s, and opening up, first of all, to the DDR, to Eastern Germany, but also, of course, to the rest of the countries of the Warsaw Pact, and, uh, of course, the Soviet Union um, itself. So, and that's my, so the first point is uh, the, the end of Ostpolitik and the end of Merkel's uh, strategy vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia, and maybe even vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis China. Secondly, is this new German coalition that came to power, the traffic light coalition, a kind of never seen combination of greens, uh, liberals, free market liberals, uh, not American type liberals, European liberals and, and social Democrats. And it was seen that Schultz was a very weak figure, um, a weak chancellor who had to keep to hold together this very, um, you know, unedited or whatever, ne never seen before coalition. And that it really was about a green transition for the Greens and a digital transition for, uh, for the Liberals. And that for the SPD, it was gonna to be tough because both Liberals and Greens were much tougher on Russia, especially the Greens that, that thought the relationship between Germany and um, Russia under Putin had gotten way too close. And of course, the personification of that leadership was former Chancellor, Social Democratic Chancellor Gerhard Schröder himself. I don't know if any of you remember, but two weeks ago, Schultz came to Washington, met with Biden, and he couldn't even say the words Nord Stream 2, right? A week later, he himself pulled the plug from Nord Stream 2. And so if you look at the, the, the evolution of, of the sanctions, uh, where Europe was even five days ago and where they are today, under enormous pressure, uh, they caved on, on SWIFT, for example, right? It was really the visit by Polish uh, Prime Minister Morawiecki uh, on Thursday and Friday that made them change their minds in Berlin. And that, that he, he kind of talked to their moral conscience, like, don't, don't worry about the fallout. This is really about Ukraine and we need to uh, help them. But the energy transition, that's gonna be incredibly important, right? Schultz promised to basically divest from Russian gas and build two new terminals in uh, liquefied natural gas and where they're gonna diver diversify towards. And then of course, as, as Anne already mentioned, weapons, right? This huge taboo since World War II of Germany exporting weapons, lethal weapons to help uh, other, other countries. 100 anti-tank weapons, 50 Stinger anti-aircraft missiles. And then of course, the big one is the defense budget, right? They are actually now gonna speed up and getting serious about the 2% commitment to NATO. But this is 2% of an enormous GDP, right? I mean, Germany is now on course to become the biggest military power in the European Union. So bigger than France in, in budget and bigger than the United Kingdom because its GDP is so much bigger. Plus they've committed to a hundred billion uh, euro special investment fund that will be off uh, the books um, on, on the fence that's, uh, that's starting. So again, these, these things are, are enormous, right? For, for a German political elite that uh, is traditionally more pacifist, is very conscious about their uh, about their past and so on, World War II and, and all that. So that, that I think is significant. And that's my final point. What does this mean for European integration and for the European Union? So of course, the 20 teens, just like the 1970s, have been a, a decade full of crises, right? Where a lot of analysts, especially on this side of the Atlantic, were very quick, or the other side of the channel, I should say, in Britain, were very quick to dismiss uh, the EU as, as, as finished, right? As falling apart, as Brexit being the first member to leave and this quickly uh, following. It seems to me that the 2020s will be a decade just like the 1980s and the 1950s of building, of institution building and of a new strategic concept for the EU. And I think they will come together around EU sovereignty and EU strategic autonomy, not because it's that coherent a concept, but because they all will have their own interpretation of it and will be able to sell this at home, as diplomats know, that's usually how these things move forward. So we are, I think, moving into a very French vision of European integration, Macron's vision, and it looks like he will be uh, re-elected now, especially because his three biggest opponents on the right all have very comfortable relations 
with Putin and with Russia and really have to uh, grapple with this. So it seems like he's facing very little opposition. But here, uh, the French vision of strategic autonomy when it comes to defense, when it comes to energy independence, when it comes to financial and economic geopolitical tools, using the Euro, just like the United States uses the dollar, using its uh, giant market. And when it comes to investment screening, when it comes to export controls and so on, where the EU does have uh, sole uh, powers. I think that is something we're gonna see a lot more of in the next decade. So let me end on the, the um, prospect of EU membership. And that's where I think um, we have to be incredibly careful as the EU and the United States. But we are in many ways in this situation right now in Ukraine because of promises, I think, both when it comes to NATO membership and EU membership, that very few elites on, um, in the EU and uh, the United States were intended on keeping. And so right now the Ukrainians, I mean, there's a lot of support and so on, but you know, not really as much as one would hope, right? And so for von der Leyen yesterday to say the Ukrainians places in, in Europe, I mean, that's, that's her saying this, them 10 minutes ago signing their application to the EU. I mean, I, I, I think we, we would all applaud the reforms that would come with this, but I don't think the EU is ready uh, for this at all. And I, I think cautious on, on caution on this, um, particular issue would be would be well warranted. Thanks, Jim, back over to you. Thanks, Matthias. And uh, it raises the question, which we'll come back to after we've heard from people individually about how the story ends and where, where is the path forward on all of this. Let me turn now to our, our colleague, uh, Professor Thomas Rigg, who's a professor of strategic studies at SAIS and has spent more than a decade of experience in international security and intelligence studies. Um, and uh, in particular, uh, Tomas's uh, work here and building a program in cybersecurity and a lot of interest in the potential of uh, Putin using cyber tools as a part of uh, his efforts to control Ukraine and to influence uh, the public discourse both in Russia and abroad. So Tomas, it's turn to you, please. Thank you. Although I actually will not uh, say anything about cyber uh, or disinformation now, but actually on the revolution really on the sea change in European policy, policy, and in fact, predominantly German, the German approach to the crisis. And I'll start with a personal comment as well, like Eugene and Sergei. Uh, I, I am German, as uh, some of you may be able to hear immediately. Um, and uh, I'm also European. My, I grew up with stories of my neighbors, traumatized former Wehrmacht soldiers, telling me again and again as a kid how they stabbed, bayoneted, dead Russian soldiers, because those were the orders on the Eastern Front when advancing as an infantry officer. My own grandfather was interned in Auschwitz briefly, not obviously as a, as a, as a victim, but um, he was captured not far, too far away from the camp uh, and, and, and stayed there just a few weeks after it was liberated on his way to uh, become a prisoner of war in Russia for more than three years. My other grandfather made it out of Stalingrad as a tank driver. When Putin describes the goal of this operation as the goal to denazify Ukraine, then what he's doing, he, he's not just insulting Zelensky, uh, obviously a, a man of Jewish extraction, He's not just insulting Ukrainians, he is insulting every self-respecting European and especially every self-respecting German uh, on the entire continent. It is no coincidence that, uh, you know, just this morning in an interview, the German defense minister, uh, Christine uh, Lamprecht, a social democrat, gives really a badass answer in response to how and when German weapons and you know, just let that sink in. Germany is now providing very quickly 1,000 anti-tank weapons and 500 uh, 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 ground-to-air missiles for air defense to Ukraine to fight Russians in the first, I mean, we know what we're looking at. That is extraordinary. Not just uh, did she and the chancellor authorize that. They said getting the weapons there is a question of hours, not days. They're already en route. It is also no coincidence that the president of the European Commission is a former German defense minister. I think it's impossible to overstate the effect in Europe that Putin's 
uh, extraordinary, extraordinarily misguided rhetoric about denazification as having. I think it's it's such an extraordinary insult uh, that uh, we cannot imagine. I cannot imagine Putin ever attending a global summit summit again. And uh, and I'll close just by thanking him, thanking him for achieving what no European politician has achieved in a generation. He has given the European Union a, or made the European Union discover its spine. He has made NATO cool again, something I thought I would never see. And finally, he managed to get German over a historic trauma. The historic trauma obviously was for a long time never to fight again, avoiding wars by not fighting, by not providing weapons. Um, but of course, uh, we have shifted and now have the approach that avoiding war sometimes actually means going means defending yourself and helping others to defend themselves so those are my personal comments thank you great comments thanks for that um uh, as we kind of continue our tour around europe i'm going to turn next to um uh, dan serwer who is a senior fellow at our foreign policy institute here at size where he uh, taught conflict management for a decade and as many of you know, um, Dan uh, had a long and distinguished career at the State Department, including uh, a, a very important role as a special envoy and coordinator for the Bosnian Federation. So Dan, you wanna share your perspective from that part of the world? Thank you, Jim. Uh, I'll talk about two parts of the world. I'll have a few remarks about the Balkans and the impact, the repercussions of what's going on in Ukraine in the Balkans, where the repercussions are really quite strong and then a bit about the Middle East, where the repercussions are much more ambiguous. American policy since the end of the Cold War has aimed at what diplomats call Europe whole and free. And I think it's quite clear now that that isn't going to happen so long as Putin or someone of his ilk rules Russia. Serbia is claiming neutrality, but its current leadership advocates a Serbian home akin to Putin's Russian home and refuses to sanction Moscow. Belgrade is de facto siding with Russia. That has repercussions throughout the Balkans because it puts Bosnia, Kosovo, and NATO member Montenegro at risk from Serb irredentism. The line between democracies and autocracies, and I think there will be a new line. It won't be an iron curtain, maybe more like a plywood curtain, inflexible, but still not impregnable, will therefore also be drawn through the Balkans unless Belgrade changes its inclinations. I think there are things we can do about that, uh, but maybe I'll leave that uh, for later discussion if anyone is interested. In the Middle East, the situation is far more ambiguous because the interests are attenuated and US policy is far more accepting of autocracy. Syria is of course backing Russia. Iran is attempting the Chinese straddle, I would call it for peace, but against Ukrainian membership in NATO. Egypt, the UAE and other Gulf monarchies are really ducking for cover. And Saudi Arabia so far has decided just to basically keep silent and enjoy high oil prices. Israel is backing Ukraine, but cautiously to avoid Russian retaliation against its interests in Syria and domestic political complications. Uh, Evgeny may wanna comment on that. Uh, Turkey has also backed Ukraine, uh, but far less cautiously. The Turkish drones really do appear to make an enormous difference. They did in Libya and they seem to be doing the same thing in Ukraine. Ultimately, I think the Middle East is not a place that will be divided, it'll go with the flow. If Russia is successful in subjugating Ukraine, no one in the Middle East will refuse to maintain diplomatic relations with a puppet government in Kyiv. OPEC plus uh, would be invigorated, reinvigorated in that case, and Russian inroads into the M Middle East 
will expand, but without the very sharp line between American and, and Russian influence that I anticipate in the Balkans. But if Russia fails, and I think this is important to understand, not only in the Middle East, but elsewhere as well, if Russia fails, uh, it's a big failure for autocracy. And uh, democracies and autocracies alike in the Middle East will be happy to claim they supported Ukraine, even if OPEC plus suffers irreparable damage. Uh, let me add just a quick word about a SICE activity that uh, went to Ukraine uh, just a few years ago, a student trip uh, organized by the Conflict Management Program. And Terry Hopman has reminded me uh, that that group visited uh, uh, groups of people, one associated with the Donetsk National University, a Russian language university, another a group of displaced people uh, receiving humanitarian assistance, they had all fled west, not east. And I think that tells you something about the viability of Ukraine as a unified state. Thanks, Dan. And uh, it's important that we keep in mind that there, there are broad and divergent perspectives around the world uh, on this crisis, as we saw the UAE abstained in the Security Council vote, as did India. And so we may have a chance to talk a little bit about some of the perspectives outside the immediate area of conflict. We're next going to turn to a, a group of a number of our colleagues who are uh, have had extensive experience in the U.S. government and are, are well-regarded commentators on U.S. policy to, to focus on that aspect. And I'm going to begin um, with Hal Brand, since uh, Hal will need to leave uh, somewhat earlier than the others here. Um, Hal is the Henry A. Kissinger Distinguished Professor of Global Affairs and a member of the Kissinger Center for Global Affairs, as well as a senior fellow um, at the American Enterprise Institute and has had his own experience in the Pentagon. So let's um, begin uh, with you, Hal. Hey, thank you, Jim, and, and thanks also to my, all my colleagues for their comments. I'm just going to start with a word of caution, which is that it is early in this conflict. And so the assumption five days ago was that this thing was going to be over in 48 hours as the Russians rolled into every major city in Ukraine. The assumption now seems to be that the invasion has failed and that we are in the at the part of the conflict where we look for diplomatic off ramps. That may be the case, but it, it may not be. I think Putin's incentives to double down are extremely high. I think he has to deliver some form of military progress to make good on the, the sacrifices and to redeem himself a bit. And I actually think we're, we're headed into a very dangerous phase of the conflict. As the Russians discover that their initial plan, which, which basically appeared to hinge on the idea of kind of a lightning strike uh, into Kiev that would that would bring down Ukrainian resistance to the government as that has failed, they will be more tempted to use more indiscriminate means of bombardment of major cities to secure capitulation. And we're seeing a little bit of that already. At the same time, and for very good reason, we are seeing uh, NATO countries and European countries, uh, as well as the United States, pour munitions and, and pour platforms into Ukraine in a significant way. And so there's a little bit of a race going on right now on the one side to strengthen Ukraine's defensive capabilities to give it a better chance of holding out over the long on the long term and on the other side to bring enough pressure to allow the Russian forces to make some sort of significant breakthrough and, and so I think that the most dangerous and the tensest part of this crisis is still in front of us and I don't know whether that's three days from now or three weeks from now or three months from now but I expect we have a long way to go before we know what the outcome is on the ground. I will say, though, that I think that this crisis is going to have lasting global ramifications, not just uh, economic co consequences, not just consequences in, in cyberspace, not just consequences for European defense and European cohesion, as important as all those things are. This is really a global geopolitical event. And you can see this in the way that countries outside uh, of Europe, outside of the tr what's traditionally thought of as the West, are themselves becoming players in this conflict. Japan, Taiwan, a number of other countries in the Asia Pacific have essentially joined what is really an unprecedented sanctions campaign, in part because they're worried about the spillover. 
And so I, I think that, that they're worried about the precedent, I guess that I should say, that this could create for Chinese aggression uh, in the Western Pacific. And so I could see this crisis having a really significant effect on uh, US-China relations as well. On the one hand, maybe it creates persistent distraction for the United States and makes it impossible for the United States to focus as squarely on China as the Biden administration clearly hoped to in the first year of its presidency. On the other hand, maybe it convinces a bunch of countries and Asia Pacific elsewhere to get far more serious about their efforts to compete with China because they don't wanna see the same thing happen in the Taiwan Strait that has happened to Ukraine. And so again, it's a little bit early to figure out where all of this is, is heading, but I expect it's going to produce important global realignments and we're only starting to see the consequences. I'll stop there, thanks. It's an intriguing uh, set of observations. I think the situation and the potential impact on China is a very complicated and interesting one, and perhaps we can turn to that a bit in the, in the conversation as well. But I next wanna to turn um, to my distinguished predecessor, um, Elliot Cohen, who is uh, now the Robert E. Osgood Professor here at SAIS, where he's taught since 1990. And among his many other distinguished um, elements of his career, he um, served uh, in the Department of Defense and Counselor at the State Department. So, Dean Cohen. Well, thank you, Dean Steinberg, although I think we can go Jim and Elliot at this point, don't you think? Um, first, I want to uh, thank my, uh, my colleagues for a set of very interesting remarks. I, I want to build on um, words that have been uh, used by, by them about history moving very fast uh, and about things that are simply astonishing. I've spent uh, the last week first at the Munich Security Conference, and then I was in Warsaw, um, leaving just as uh, the invasion started. And as I reflect on the conversations I had, I am really struck by how wrong most of us were about most things. And that includes people who I think of as very acute advisors. And so what I find myself reflecting on is why was that the case? So let me divide that into three bits. The first is on personalities. Um, you know, I think, um, I think most analysts would have considered Putin as, uh, I think, Sergey, you described him as a rational calculator, maybe not quite like us. Um, and they did not think he would uh, roll the iron dice in uh, quite the way that he has. Uh, in fact, I think the better way of understanding him was really as a bit of a study in the psychopathology of, uh, of autocrats. And I think that really is the best way to understand him now. So the, I think a, an overemphasis on rationalism uh, as an explanation for the behavior of somebody like that. Uh, well, on the other hand, uh, we need to remind ourselves what the general view of Zelensky was, that this was a former comic, not particularly serious, young, um, you know, out of his class. Turns out he's an inspirational war leader. We don't know the ins and outs of how he's dealing with his generals, but uh, he gave an electrifying speech at uh, Munich, which got two standing ovations. That's quite unusual. But more importantly, in the thick of this war, um, he's been positively heroic. So I think it's a reminder that personalities matter an enormous amount, and it's very, very easy to misread them. Second thing that strikes me is the uh, military analysis. If you look at a lot of the military analysis that was buzzing around before uh, the Russian invasion, you would see there was really a very high estimation of the Russian military, uh, which at least so far as we are right now, really looks to have been misplaced. Now, some of this gets into very technical detail, but it's not just that the initial strikes were not particularly effective, uh, that the Russians have taken much higher losses than they expected. They botched a whole bunch of initial operations like airfield seizures. Um, but it comes, I think, from a, an underestimation of, the, of you know, the impact of morale, uh, motivation, uh, things which are very old. And um, we live in a technological age, and I think we've overestimated uh, the role of technology. The fact is, most of those Russian soldiers are 18 and 19-year-old kids. Uh, they have no idea what they're doing there, uh, and they're not particularly effective. And even at the tactical level, the Russians are much less effective than people think. So we misjudge them. We also misjudge the Ukrainians. And I think that's an important thing too. I think we miss, and once again, it results from 
underestimating the importance of motivation, uh, of determination of the, what Clausewitz called the moral factor in war, and it still counts. And then finally, something that has been discussed by a number of colleagues is uh, quite astonishing behaviors by the democracies. Germany doing this pivot, throwing twice uh, the equivalent of twice of its annual defense budget at defense spending was extraordinary. But even countries like Sweden sending, ten, sending thousands of anti-tank missiles uh, to the Ukrainians um, or you know, the skill of American diplomacy, which has been quite remarkable. I was quite critical of the Biden administration, and I'm tremendously struck by how they've managed the alliance. The way in which the democracies have had it all over Russia in terms of information warfare, um, selectively releasing intelligence that prevented the Russians from distorting the picture, but then even in the day-to-day, -day, the way in which the Ukrainians have won the information war. And I think the lesson here is... Um, that we've been too much under the thrall of a kind of democratic pessimism. And that in the United States, that stems from the difficult uh, decade or so that we've had and which, you know, casts a pall on everything. But if there's something hopeful in this, what is a catastrophic story in many ways, it's that it turns out that democracies are resilient. They can rebound. They can surprise you in quite positive ways. Um, they can be skilled, they can be capable, they can be effective. Uh, that's what we always used to believe. And I think that's what we should believe. I just want to conclude. I say, again, like my colleagues, and this is very, we're entering a very dangerous period. I think the, the Russians are now going to turn to a, a strategy, if you can call it that, of bombing Ukrainian cities into rubble. They've begun that in Kharkiv. It'll be brutal. It'll be bloody. It'll cause enormous suffering. Uh, I don't think it'll ultimately work. Um, and the people of, the, of Ukraine are paying the price for events that may, in the end, make for a better world. But we should never forget the price that they're paying and do what we can to, uh, to help them out. Thanks, Elliot. Um, it's a uh, great lead into our next speaker as we think about both the, uh, the question about the intelligence analysis of Putin's motives and, and his goals, as well as um, Elliot's point about how the intelligence has been used by the United States and others to try to shape uh, international opinion that we turn to uh, John McLaughlin, who, as you all know, is a distinguished practitioner in residence at the Merrill Center here at SICE, a uh, 1966 graduate of SICE. Uh, and uh, former acting director of the CIA, among his many uh, remarkable uh, elements of service uh, for the U.S. government. So, John. Uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, do you have video? Not yet. Okay. There we go. Okay. Yep. Thank you, Jim. I'm going to make some comments about the intelligence aspects, but first, let me give you a couple of impressions, some of which uh, mirror what my colleagues have said, and thank my colleagues also for these very insightful comments. So impressive. My first point is that I'm convinced that Putin has miscalculated here in a way that for the first time in the 20 years that I've watched him poses a genuine threat to his survival in Russia. That's not a prediction, it's, it's an estimate of the risk to him at this point. And in that sense, I think I'm agreeing uh, with uh, Anne Applebaum and with Mary Surratt. And I base this on a series of things that I would put under the heading of out of touch. First, he's out of touch with Ukraine. He has no idea what Ukraine really is other than a threat to him. Having been in and out of Ukraine a number of times between 1991 and 2018, officially, unofficially, even as a tourist, Ukraine today is not even remotely the same country it was in 1991. Then it was a crumbling, broken, dark, depressing former Soviet Republic. Now, as I think we all can see, it is a vibrant, modernizing, westward looking, a functioning democracy in, in which the champions of democracy will readily admit they have a long way to go in terms of combating corruption. 
Uh, and anyone who's been in and out of Ukraine should not really be very surprised by the reaction we're seeing. When I was last there, a young parliamentarian, I would say about 30 years old, there's a new generation, that's another key thing about Ukraine. Uh, a young parliamentarian who was head of their foreign affairs committee said to me, you know, Ukraine is the only country that can change Russia. And she explained, look, if we become everything we want to become, a functioning, prosperous, westward looking democracy, it threatens Putin's whole system because Russians will want that too. This I believe is Ann Applebaum's point. And I agree with her that I think that's the driver here more than anything else in Putin's fear calculus. Second, I think he's out of touch with his own country. Um, I think, again, I've been in and out of Russia quite a bit in that period of time, 91 through 2018. And I think Russians will be ashamed of what he is doing. If they see and understand what he is doing, if they see it, and I think uh, the internet is still functioning there. Uh, social media is still functioning. Uh, even Russian elites that I've dealt with who are able generally to support the government and even in a kind of way explain why he did what he did in Crimea. I haven't talked to them, but I think they would be looking at the floor, looking at their shoes, trying to explain what he's doing now. Um, you know, on a human level, Russians are very sentimental about family, about their mothers, their wives, their children, uh, their husbands. It's a very sentimental country. And to see fellow Slavic uh, people uh, herded into subways, given on to driving onto trains, leaving their families behind, at an emotional level, this won't sell in Russia. And to pick up on something that several people have said, if he goes now to the extent of pulverizing cities, um, I, I, I think that will be a, a threat to his own power in Russia because that's just, that's just not something Russians would want to see done in Ukraine, which they think of as a, as a brother country, sister country, whatever. Third, he's out of touch with, um, with data and information. Uh, we've long felt, and I think increasingly it's established, that he doesn't have an intelligence service that that has any uh, practice of truth to power or tell it like it is. Uh, otherwise, and you could see a bit of this in that, that incredible meeting he had with his, his uh, government people in which the intelligence director started to equivocate just the slightest bit, which I think might've been an attempt to actually speak a little truth to power. And Putin slapped him down. And you know that's what happens to you when you bring the boss bad news, which is historically the case in autocratic societies. It was in Hitler's Germany, it was in Stalin's Soviet Union. So I don't think he gets information. And as to whether someone is able to walk in and tell him, like others who have addressed that question, I don't know, but I don't think so, particularly in this period of isolation. And finally, he's out of touch with the world. You know, I think you could characterize the common global reaction to this as in one sentence, we just don't do this anymore. We, we just don't do this anymore. The fact that he has no clue on that shows how out of touch he is with the world. As others have said, the performance of the Russian military has been uh, pretty dismal. And I, I don't think this can end well for Putin. Um, the best case for him at this point is that he remains in power, but is a, a pariah to the end of his life. No more meetings. You know, he got back into meetings and international gatherings after Crimea, after a bit of sheepish uh, tiptoeing up to them. I don't think that's going to happen again. On the intelligence uh, sharing, just let me say a word. I've asked, been asked so many times, is there a risk to sharing all of this intelligence that we've provided, which I think has had the effect of throwing him a little off balance. One thing I've noticed in dealing with Russians when I've had to tell them something from intelligence that has been cleared for their understanding, and I've been able to say, we know you're doing this, but I can't tell you how, 
they will always deny it, but it helps that they know we know. It throws them off balance a little bit. I think that's what these releases have done with him. And also, it has helped to galvanize the Western alliance and perhaps to give the American public a sense for what's going on and the administration's efforts. Is there a risk? Yes, there always is. But it's a matter of calculating risk versus benefit. And in this case, I think the benefit outweighs the risk. And we have ways of sanitizing. That's the term people use. Intelligence that delivered like this in order to conceal the sources and methods. Um, I would just conclude by saying um, several people have referred and uh, Dean Steinberg to China. I think I'm not going to say much more about it, except to say that the complexity of this calculus for China is worth thinking about and watching. Much has been said about it already, but while it may galvanize Asian partners to think a little differently about China, it might also cause China to pause and think about the reaction that they are seeing to the kind of aggression that is occurring in in Ukraine. Now, I'll stop there. Thanks, John, so much to reflect on there. And we've got lots of great questions from the listeners. We're gonna to turn to that in a second, but we're fortunate enough to conclude with at another experienced US government official, Adam Zubin, who is a distinguished practitioner in residence at SICE. Um, among his many uh, elements and areas of expertise, of course, is his uh, role at Treasury as the uh, acting undersecretary for terrorism and financial intelligence at Treasury and his role in financial sanctions, which has become really, a, really the critical question of the day is the, the nature and effectiveness of the strategy that the United States and others are, are pursuing to try to uh, affect Putin's calculations here. So over to you, Adam. Thank you very much. Um, it's a fascinating discussion. So. Sanctions, as you say, uh, have been in this crisis, as in so many others over the last 15 years, the primary instrument of choice that the West has used to respond to a foreign adversary. And uh, what we've seen in this case is that play out on just a larger and far more uh, aggressive scale than ever before. The sanctions in the last 72 hours are in the last 20 years unprecedented in terms of their breadth, their scope, and their speed. So um, what has happened? I would break it up into really two periods. Putin, who is often credited for being a great tactician, from a sanctions perspective, did the dumbest thing you could do, which is mass troops on the borders of Ukraine, 130, 140,000 troops, columns of tanks, and then park them there and give the West time to organize. That uh, time was used very well by Europe, by the UK, by Washington, to build not just a strong coalition, but a package of sanctions whose intent was deterrence. They were very clear in communicating to Russia, you invade Ukraine and you're going to see sanctions that go far beyond what you saw in 2014, 2015 with the occupation of Crimea and the activities in the Donbass. Uh, and as I said, I think they use the time well. We saw what that package looks like. Uh, that was Wednesday and Thursday of this past week. So it involved sweeping export controls that limit the export of semiconductors, software, maritime sensors, avionics to Russia. And that is uh, trying to identify key inputs that Russia needs and that Russia can't easily get from China or from elsewhere. So uh, broad export controls. And then I think what was intended to be the most muscular part of the punch, banking and financial sanctions. The US named VTB, the second largest bank, put it on the SDN list to block all assets that it has in the control of US persons worldwide and cut it off from the dollar and the US financial system. That is the largest bank to my knowledge that's ever been blocked as well as the seventh, eighth, ninth largest banks in Russia and VEB, which is the Russian Development Finance uh, Institution that also services Russia's sovereign debt. And then with respect to Spurbank, the largest bank in Russia, they said in 30 days, it loses access to the dollar. 
this is uh, a truly very powerful response. And I think it's what we know they had been working on in private. That was Thursday. And then without um, much time for that to sink in, I think policymakers were yanked forward in their escalation memos. The notion, I'm sure, originally was to let those sanctions sink in, let their impacts play out through the Russian banking sector. Hopefully, you would see runs on banks, people queuing up as we were starting to see in lines to withdraw funds from ATMs. Russia's central bank have to pour in resources to prop up the afflicted banks. Um, but Putin's the, uh, scale and severity of his invasion prompted a qualitatively stronger response. And when I say the allies were yanked forward to the back of their sanctions memo, they were doing things that are normally reserved for uh, the near uh, last stages, the penultimate stages of a sanctions campaign. Sanctioning the head of state, Vladimir Putin himself, which is often viewed in sanctions world as tantamount to a call for regime change. De-swifting many Russian banks, cutting them off from their ability to send encrypted messages on what is the global monopoly on interbank communication. And then, as we saw over the weekend, sanctioning Russia's central bank. And that's really one of the outermost edges of where you go in sanctions. Um, and what we're talking about now is having broad sanctions from where I would describe them as probably a two out of 10 several weeks ago on Russia to Thursday when they became a six out of 10 to today when I would say we're at an eight and a half out of 10. And the uh, alliance has spread to include not just the usual suspects, Canada, the US, UK, Europe, Australia, but Japan has signed on, Switzerland uh, has signed on. There's been uh, a lot of shame attached to sitting this out and trying to claim neutrality. And I imagine there's tremendous pressure right now on India, on China in a different way to, uh, if they're not going to join the sanctions, at least not to backfill. What does this mean? Well, the fact that the central bank has been sanctioned means that their reserves, Russia's foreign reserves in any of the sanctioning countries are off limits. They're formally blocked. Uh, and that is more than 50% of Russia's 600 plus billion in reserves. But even more significantly, perhaps, it means that the money that Russia holds in foreign reserves in other countries, let's say in a place like India or China, can't be moved out of country. They're bottled up. So yes, they'll be able to buy a lot of textiles and rice from India, um, and they'll be able to buy a lot of consumer goods from China, but their ability to reposition their reserves, rebalance their banking sheets has been really crippled by the last 72 hours of sanctions. Uh, if they hadn't shut down their stock market today, I think you would see a convulsion. And I think what we're gonna see in the next coming days in terms of the value of the ruble, in terms of inflation in Russia is going to be seismic. That in turn plays into something that a number of panelists have talked about, which is the Russian domestic political reaction? Do you see people pouring into the streets? My understanding is that Russia's state media has done a pretty good job so far in shielding the truth from the Russian people. Well, the sanctions are going to bring the truth home. This is going to touch every household in Russia. So will that lead to more pressure from the street uh, in terms of household opinion, and uh, which Putin does care about? And will it lead to potentially the elites uh, security and business elites turning on Putin. It's too soon to tell, but all of that is at stake with sanctions at such a high level. Thanks, Adam. So this really, you know, sharply raises the question. I mean, now that um, the United States and its partners have have raised the ante so high, how does this end? Is is there a further escalation? Is there something? Does this back? As uh, Mary, I think talked and others talked about putting into a corner, which requires him to lash out even further, or, or is there an off ramp? And, and a number of the questions that you all have posed, and we have now more than 50 questions in the chat, which I'm going to try to help consolidate along with uh, my colleague, Chris Crosby, who's also been monitoring the questions, but many of them are focused on this very question. Is there an escalation option? 
for Putin? Is there a de-escalation option? And is there a way out, given especially the analysis that so many of you have, have pushed that this is, if this is about Ukraine and Ukraine's identity and Putin's denial of even the, the legitimacy of the existence of the Ukrainian state? And I'm going to ask Sergey if you would start on this, and then I'll invite any or all of the, the panelists here to, uh, to share their thoughts as well. Right. Uh, yeah, thank you for this wonderful uh, set of presentations. Really extremely, uh, extremely interesting and enlightening. Um, I was in Moscow recently, uh, as some of you know, walking down the, that same, that area in the center of Moscow that is called the Strasno Boulevard. Um, uh, and uh, one thing that struck me, I just I was sure if I remember the last time that I was I walked those same streets was in 2019, where there was a massive protest against Putin. It was unsanctioned. And I joined the protest and, well, you know, we we're just walking down and the riot police came down, were beating the hell out of people and they were being dragged into police van, which is really scary thing. And one thing that struck me going down that same route just a couple of weeks ago was uh, was to see nothing just so quiet it was so quiet and that reminds you of the fact that the russian opposition has been disorganized and effectively you know destroyed beheaded uh, alexei navalny is in is in prison facing potentially a very very uh, serious you know already well he's already in prison but he's facing more jail uh, time now uh, uh, for all kinds of made up on all kinds of made up pretext. Many other leaders of the Russian opposition have been chased out of the country. You know, they're, they, they've gone to Latvia or to, uh, to the UK uh, or other destinations. And it seems now that it's very difficult to mobilize the Russians inside the country. And even, even so, we have seen anti-war protests unfold in recent days. People bravely going out on the streets and actually, you know, hundreds or actually thousands of people, thousands of people were being arrested, um, which is, you know, truly something because if you go to protests in uh, Russia, I mean, you face arrest, yeah, you face being beaten by the police. And personally, after going to the protest the last time we had this, you know, in, back in 2019, I thought, of, I thought to myself, is that really worth it for myself? You know, do I really want to be dragged down and beaten by the police, etc.? And I think a lot of those, a lot of Russians are asking those questions, which makes it all the more impressive that some people are actually going out there and showing solidarity with, uh, uh, with the world, really, standing against Putin's aggression in Ukraine, so it's very impressive. Nevertheless, it is important also to keep in mind that in Russia, revolutions rarely come from down below. Usually we have coups, usually we have something that starts from above, even Gorbachev's uh, uh, revolution was started from above. And when we did have public action, as, as many of you would know, this was actually very late in the game when when already the screws have been untightened and there was considerable uh, freedom to express one's opinions. Um, uh, otherwise, you know, we we have uh, we have had uh, uh, revolutions in Russia and coups uh, or attempted coups, and they're all engineered from above. So I don't have I, I don't have great hopes for grassroots action. Um, uh, uh, there we may have even an effect of consolidation of some kind of public opinion around Putin. Will we have that as a result of the sanctions? Will we have again the state narrative of all oh, the West is against us, the whole world is against us, so we have to stand together? It's a possible outcome. We just you know we just don't know. We have to be realistic about it. But as of now, what we can see now is that there's certainly a sizable number of Russians who are against uh, the war and who are obviously against the regime. Uh, but there's also a huge number of people who do suppress, uh, do support, support it. Um, uh, uh, so what I expect personally is we'll have greater repressions in Russia. We will in coming days. Uh, I'm I have a very, uh, very gloomy outlook, and I don't see anything positive coming out of internal Russian political situation. I, I see greater repressions and more darkness ahead. Great, thanks, Sergey. So I'm gonna. I have a couple of other colleagues who want to come in on this. I want to start though with. Uh, Thomas, just uh, to push you on the, the question I tried to tee up earlier, and you, uh, you gave us those other really powerful remarks, which is a lot of our questions have asked, why no cyber yet, and is this something yet to come? And then I'll turn next to John and then to uh, Elliot for, for their comments as well. Um, so why no cyber? And um, 
I think it's early days. Cyber operations in the context of um, operations of the kind that we are seeing um, are likely to be less effective perhaps, but also less visible than most observers have assumed for you know decades at this point because of the high pitched cyber war conversation. So what, what I would expect to see are covert operations, you know, hack and leak operations. And in fact, we have seen those if we, if we look closely, potentially um, uh, attacks against infrastructure. Um, again, these attacks are design, would, be assigned, would be designed to be covert, at least for a, a transition period, um, not openly admitted um, and, um, and in your face, so to speak. So I would reserve judgment, judgment for now. Um, I don't think um, we can say that there isn't, hasn't, haven't been any cyber operations, um, and I think more are coming. And I would just briefly add, if there is a long-term insurgency going on in uh, Ukraine, early days, we don't know how the conflict will pan out, but if there's going to be an insurgency, it will have more high-powered, high-tech intelligence support from Western allies than any insurgency we've ever seen before. Um, so that's an aspect of cyber operations that I think will be fascinating to watch Very if it comes to that. So John, uh, to you next and, and both on this and, and the escalation options. I mean, Thomas talked about cyber in the context of the theater, but what about uh, cyber attacks on Western banking systems or retaliation for the freeze on um, Russian assets or even the, the, this very you know, old Cold War-ish uh, nuclear uh, saber rattling, which a number of our questions have asked about. So, John, first to you, and then to Elliot. I don't think the options for Putin here are good in any way. I don't think Putin has any good options here. And so, um, allowing for Hal's point that we're in early days and expect surprises and we don't know where it's going and the classic strategic point that when you inflict violence, you really don't know where it's going, allowing for all of that. I can see three uh, kind of avenues here for, for Putin. He can back out and come up with some explanation for how this was all just a misunderstanding. I don't think that's likely can't imagine it happening. Number two, he can double down. And various people here have described what doubling down means, but it almost always includes a component of very heavy military destruction in Ukraine. And I think that will only play into the problem he has now, which is, uh, I think, a serious, if not revolt, certainly a serious revulsion in Russia as, as to what he's doing. I, I just don't see Russians tolerating and being comfortable with the kind of double down image we have. Or third, we somehow can come up with a face saving way diplomatically for him to, to, to move out of this. I don't know what that is. You know, if you went back before he did this, you could probably find some trade space in the Donbass uh, area uh, based on the Minsk agreement and some, um, you know, artfully worded uh, statements about autonomy. I don't think you can do that now because he's uh, shot that all to pieces. But I, I would hope that Western diplomats uh, are thinking heroically about how we can come up with a face-saving way out for him. Because without that, I don't think this goes anywhere Good, and if it goes on in some sort of grinding way where what we see is more of what we see now, there will be an insurgency. It will be supported by the West, uh, thinking really far out about this. Think Spanish Civil War. Think people showing up from all over the world wanting to fight with the Ukrainians. And we certainly have ways to facilitate that, were it to come to that. Intriguing, John. So, uh, Elliot, next, and then Mary, I'm going to ask if, if you're uh, inclined to come in yourself on the question about what an off ramp might be or what the United States and, and the West might be able to do to make it possible for Putin uh, to find a way to de escalate. But first, Elliot. Yeah, so I, um, I actually don't think there's an off ramp. Um, I don't think there's a solution that would be acceptable to him 
that uh, would leave us with an independent Ukraine from which uh, Russia has withdrawn. Uh, I don't think there ever actually was much of an option of any kind of negotiated settlement with him because the things that I, I believe are driving him are just so large that they're not negotiable. It's, I don't think he accepts the existence of Ukraine as an independent state. I think there is this existential fear of democratic uh, revolutions. So I, um, I don't think there was that much space. And, and in addition to that, I would say that um, you know all the evidence is that his mental state is has changed. Macron apparently reported that after he spoke with them, saying this is not the same guy that I'd met with uh, before. And Marco Rubio is not a great analyst of Russian politics, but he is on the intelligence community. Recently hinted that there's there's information which suggests that he's in a very bad place. This absolutely can escalate. It could do be things like say cutting um, underwater. Uh, fiber optic cables, uh, but I think the most serious possibility is there. There is a, there, that international legion has actually already been formed, and they are moving into Ukraine. Uh, there are there are people there, are hundreds of thousands of refugees coming out. There are hundreds, possibly even more than that, flowing in, and, and large quantities of weapons and I suspect intelligence. So one of the ways this could really go um, south is uh, he decides to escalate by uh, menacing or perhaps throwing a, uh, a punch or two at Poland. Uh, and that's, I think, a serious possibility. Last thing I wanna say is, you know, I agree with those who say that revolution in Russia seems to begin from above. Uh, I would add just two things. First, you know, revolution, Nobody really ever anticipates a revolution. Uh, everybody is surprised and we'll, we'll find out. But I think there is one thing in Russian history which is worth noting, which is that protracted, unsuccessful or unpopular wars frequently bring down the regime. If you think about 1905 or if you think about Afghanistan, certainly World War I, but that's a different case. Um, all of those ended up uh, really shaking the regime. And that's why I'm, actually more inclined to think that the way this is going to end will be with Putin exiting power one way or another, but possibly after some very dangerous uh, and destructive events. Thanks, Elliot. I, I'm glad you mentioned Afghanistan because I've been thinking all through this about Afghanistan and, and I mean, obviously very different in many ways, but the certain elements both of, in terms of the Russian objectives and also the way in which the, the strategy of, of opposing it through sending in arms and other efforts to do it, it just does have certain echoes here that uh, should be on people's minds given the more recent developments in Afghanistan. Barry, we're almost at the end, but I really would like to get your thoughts about, do you see uh, an option for, for NATO or for the US to make it possible for this not to be uh, you know, uh, uh, Putin's last stand? Uh, well, uh, setting aside the question of Putin's last, last stand, which is a, a little bit separate and sort of has apocalyptic overtones to it, uh, it let's stay for now <laughs> with this crisis. Um, yeah, I, I stand by my uh, quotation of Sun Tzu, build a golden bridge for your enemy to cross over. The point here is that the enemy is Russia. And so uh, perhaps what we need to do is find a golden bridge for the people who might be able to get Russia out. And I agree with what Ann Applebaum was saying earlier. I, I think a palace coup is probably our best hope at this point. So is there a way to make that option look attractive or golden to enough people? I think that would be a, a key question. I hope very much, as I said in my remarks, that the, also the Russian people, more writ large, will also uh, want to reconsider whether they want to live in, in Putin's state. Uh, I mean, if, if these sanctions really take the bite that we're all expecting them to take, you know, living in Russia is rapidly going to become like living in North Korea, right? And, you know, you're just going to be so cut off in every possible way. Are the oligarchs around Putin or the, the power people, the Siloviki around Putin, the people who've gotten used to living in London and living in France, do they really want to live in North Korea? So I think that is the option. I, 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 I'm not betting, you know, huge amounts of money on it. But I think that that is the option that, you know, might be there. And we need to figure out a way to make that happen. And I think that this crisis, it's about many things. As my, I say to my students all the time, 
The one phenomenon I've never observed as a historian is monocausality. Major events happen for multiple reasons. This crisis is about Ukraine. This crisis is about the post-Cold War order. This crisis is about Putin's resentment of NATO expansion. This crisis is about Putin becoming unhinged. It's about a whole complex of issues. And the question is, is there some way that we can make it clear to a group of people in a position to do something about it, that they would be better off without Putin? I think that's the bridge that we're looking to build. So I'd invite you, maybe if you have a reflection on Mary, if you can think of a past example, because I, I can think of a number of, of circumstances in which we have tried to do this. We tried to do this, the United States tried to do it in Haiti to try to get the coup makers to leave and make it attractive, but they, they dug in. We tried to do that with Serbia and Milosevic uh, and the people around him and to suggest that there were ways out and it didn't work. Can you think of a time when, we, when the US or, or others have been successful in, in, in making that play work? Well, we're dealing now so this way. The stakes are a lot higher for us, so we're a lot more motivated to work on this one. I also don't think I'm trying to keep my comments brief here because we have so many, so much expertise in the room. I don't think that's the only thing we should be doing. I think we should be doing exactly what we're doing: is we should also be supplying the Ukrainians with lethal force. We should be looking at options to bring military force to bear. I, I think we should be trying every possible means to make uh, Putin back down. Uh, I, I specifically on this question, though, of uh, of off ramps, I think the shortest one would be if there were people around Putin willing to take those steps. But if not, then we're going to have a long, bloody land war in Europe. And certainly I can think of a lot of historical examples of those. Well, thanks, Mary. And thanks to everybody. We're at the end of our time, but I'm enormously grateful to all my colleagues for spending so much time in these remarkable insights and to, to so many of you out there who are listening to this. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of your questions. I would just like to conclude by echoing something that, that several of you said, which is that, you know, I think for most of us, you know, there was a kind of conviction that this thing just doesn't happen anymore. That, that yes, there's hybrid warfare and gray warfare, and and we see things nibbling around the edges. But that that you know, armies marching across borders was something that was a thing of the past. And I think that you know, the interesting question and the, the profound question here will be: Is did we need to be reminded that this was still possible for us to think hard about what we have to do to make sure? It doesn't happen. Were we too complacent about the fact that we, we didn't think this would happen anymore? Uh, or uh, will this, in some sense, be the wake up call that uh, we one would have hoped that the previous world wars had been about never to go to war like this again and to make sure that this doesn't happen? Which is why I do, do think that all of you are right in saying that this is a really critical moment for. Uh, all of us in terms of thinking about the future and what, what, what is possible and what is not and how states make their calculation about what they are able to do and what they are no longer able to do in the 21st century. And uh, it's, uh, you know, there's uh, Yogi Berra who said, there's nothing uh, harder to do than prediction, especially about the future. I think we're all humbled by our own difficulties in anticipating what this would happen. But I hope that I can uh, look forward to having all of you uh, join us again, both panelists and, and listeners, as we stay in touch with this and, and come back around these issues as it unfolds in the coming days and weeks. So thanks to all the panelists, all those listening, all those who helped put this webinar together. Uh, it has been recorded. It'll be available for uh, people to, to listen to at your leisure and uh, appreciate your time. Thanks so much.